This is Eric Strong once again, and today's video will be on hypokalemia. Let me talk first about the clinical manifestations in more detail. Although the lower limit of normal for serum potassium is usually defined as about 3.5 milliequivalents per liter, patients are almost always without any manifestations until it drops below 3.0 milliequivalents per liter. Signs and symptoms are usually limited to two organ systems. First, in the muscles, patients can develop weakness, which begins in the legs and then spreads to the arms as the hypokalemia gets more severe. Muscle cramps and an ileus can occur. Rarely, patients can develop uh, rhabdomyolysis, that is widespread breakdown and lysis of myocytes. The release of intracellular potassium during cell lysis can unfortunately mask the hypokalemia that initially triggered the rhabdo, making an accurate diagnosis particularly challenging. The other affected organ system is the heart, specifically the conduction system. Patients can develop various EKG changes and arrhythmias. AFib is the most common hypokalemia-associated rhythm, but VT and torsade are definitely the most notable and feared. The specific EKG changes that can be seen are ST depressions, T-wave inversions, and prominent U-waves, the latter of which are an uncommonly present positive waveform that comes after the T-wave but before the subsequent P-wave. Many sources report QT prolongation as another consequence of hypokalemia, but the most authoritative of sources suggest this is erroneous. The confusion regarding QT prolongation and hypokalemia arises for two reasons. First, when the U waves become prominent, there can be fusion of the T and the U waves, and when measuring the QT interval, one can inadvertently measure the QU interval instead, which will necessarily be longer. The second reason for the confusion is that hypokalemia is particularly dangerous when superimposed on pre-existing QT prolongation, which is independent of the electrolyte disorder. Here's an example of an EKG of a patient with life-threatening hypokalemia of 1.4 milliequivalents per liter that was secondary to diuretics used for hypertension. There are two things to note here. Let's zoom in on lead V4. The T wave looks very unusual with an apparent double peak. However, that second peak is actually a prominent U wave. Sometimes the T wave and U wave are separated by a brief isoelectric period, though here they obviously aren't. For the second observation, let's take a look at lead AVF. This will definitely help you appreciate why many clinicians mistake hypokalemia for a cause of QT prolongation since most people will mistake this waveform as the T wave, and thus this is as the QT interval. Actually though, this is not the T wave, but rather the U wave. The significance of the QU interval is essentially unknown. Of course, EKG changes aren't harmful in and of themselves, but rather they are a marker of increased risk of dangerous and potentially fatal arrhythmias, such as ventricular tachycardia and torsade. Such rhythms are most common when hypokalemia is combined with QT prolonging drugs, digoxin toxicity, hypomagnesemia, and active coronary ischemia. The etiologies of hypokalemia are varied, but generally fall into one of four categories. To understand the categories, let's revisit a diagram from my video on normal sodium and potassium balance. This essentially summarizes how serum, potassium, and sodium levels are controlled in the body. From this, we can see that low potassium can be the result of poor intake, excess GI loss, excess renal loss, or transmembrane redistribution to the intracellular space. As far as hormonal problems that can contribute to hypokalemia, those are essentially limited to excessive levels of aldosterone, or more generally, excessive levels of mineralocorticoids, since that also includes cortisol and other steroid-based compounds that can also block renal reabsorption of filtered potassium. I'll now review the etiologies in more detail. Poor intake requires the least discussion, aside to point out that the kidneys are usually able to resorb nearly 100% of filtered potassium. Therefore, the intake of potassium must be profoundly reduced in order for hypokalemia to develop in the absence of another etiology.
GI losses can either be from above or below, so to speak. Also consider surreptitious laxative abuse as a form of bulimia. A rare but somewhat predictable cause of hypokalemia is ureterosigmoidostomy, in which the ureters are surgically implanted into the sigmoid colon, an option for urine drainage after the bladder has been removed due to bladder cancer. This results in an increased delivery of sodium to the colon, where it is reabsorbed in exchange for potassium. Urinary losses of potassium represent the largest category of etiologies. Diuretics, specifically loop diuretics like furosemide and thiazide diuretics like HCTZ, are commonly implicated. In my personal experience, risk of hypokalemia is particularly great when furosemide is combined with the thiazide metolazone, a regimen I would strongly advise against unless the patient is having very frequent monitoring of potassium levels. As mentioned a minute ago, mineralocorticoid excess is also a major cause of urinary potassium loss. I'm going to take a brief detour here to discuss the different forms of mineralocorticoid excess. This diagram may also look familiar from the video on normal sodium and potassium balance. As you can see, it's the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone axis. It starts with low renal perfusion pressure, which leads to release of the enzyme renin. Renin converts the prehormone angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1, which is then converted to angiotensin 2, which then stimulates the production of aldosterone. The subcategories or subtypes of mineralocorticoid excess will now make a little more sense. First, there is something called primary hyperaldosteronism. This refers to situations in which the main defect is too much aldosterone, seen with aldosterone-secreting tumors, and the interesting but rare congenital adrenal hyperplasia. While aldosterone is elevated, renin levels are usually low or occasionally normal. Then there is secondary hyperaldosteronism. This refers to situations in which the main defect is too much renin and where the excess aldosterone is just secondary to that. This occurs in renovascular disease where some process such as focal atherosclerosis or vasculitis of one or both of the renal arteries leads to a decrease in renal perfusion pressure. It is also seen in renin secreting tumors. Both renin and aldosterone will be high. Last is pseudohyperaldosteronism, which as its name implies, occurs when a condition mimics excess aldosterone, but is actually the consequence of an excess of another compound with similar actions as aldosterone on renal handling of potassium. A classic example of this is Cushing syndrome due to excess cortisol. Another is administration of exogenous mineralocorticoids such as fludrocortisone, which is marketed in the U.S. under the trade name Floronef. All forms of mineralocorticoid excess are associated with excessive sodium reabsorption and thus hypertension. I'll return to the main list of etiologies of hypokalemia. Types 1 and 2 renal tubular acidosis are associated with hypokalemia. For more information about them, please see my video on normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. Salt wasting nephropathy is due to inherited defects of transporters in the renal tubule. The antifungal amphotericin B is very frequently a cause of hypokalemia due to its effect on tubular membrane permeability. Polyuria, such as that seen with either primary polydipsia or with a hyperglycemia-induced osmotic diuresis, can cause hypokalemia by delivering so much potassium to the renal tubules that it overwhelms their capacity to reabsorb it, even if they are functioning normally. The final cause of urinary loss of potassium is hypomagnesemia. Although it appears to be a common phenomenon for hypomagnesemia to induce hypokalemia, the exact mechanism by which this occurs remains unclear. The final category of etiologies comprises those which cause internal redistribution from the extracellular to the intracellular space. The typical causes of this include insulin, catecholamines, most typically during critical illness or use of exogenous vasopressors, and alkalosis. Less typical causes include market cell proliferation,
as can occur during the initial treatment of severe vitamin B12 deficiency. Finally, there is the rare muscular disorder hypokalemic periodic paralysis, which is characterized by episodes of painless muscle weakness triggered by exercise and either fasting or a high carbohydrate meal. Although the list of etiologies is long, luckily the diagnostic evaluation is fairly simple. Step one, just consider the history. The etiology of most cases will be clearly evident without any need for additional tests. If the cause isn't obvious, the next step is to check magnesium. The last consideration is to assess both the patient's acid-base status and the urine potassium to creatinine ratio. A low ratio is consistent with poor intake, GI losses, and internal redistribution, while a high ratio is consistent with renal losses. The combination of a metabolic acidosis and low potassium excretion is indicative of diarrhea or most cases of laxative abuse. Vomiting including surreptitious vomiting, along with a minority of cases of laxative abuse, will cause low potassium excretion and a metabolic alkalosis. High potassium excretion and a metabolic acidosis suggests either type 1 or 2 renal tubular acidosis, or DKA, though the latter diagnosis is usually obvious. Lastly, high potassium excretion and a metabolic alkalosis is highly suggestive of mineralocorticoid excess, but is also consistent with a much more rare salt-wasting nephropathy. Like the diagnostic evaluation, the treatment of hypokalemia is usually straightforward as there aren't many treatment options to choose from. One important general principle is that the urgency of repletion is dependent upon the rate at which the hypokalemia developed and the presence of high-risk comorbid conditions such as QT prolongation and active coronary ischemia. Treatment should obviously involve both addressing the underlying etiology and repleting potassium. There's a very common practice, at least in US hospitals, of keeping potassium super repleted. That is, even though the normal range of potassium is typically 3.5 to 5.5 milliequivalents per liter, clinicians frequently try to keep potassium above 4.0. There is absolutely no proven reason to do this in the overwhelming majority of patients. In fact, in some patients, it's impossible to do. Normal kidneys may simply have a potassium set point in the 3.5 to 4.0 range. Any potassium given to boost the serum levels above 4 will simply be excreted out as part of a normal physiologic response. Exceptions to this, where potassium is still recommended to be super repleted, include high-risk comorbidities such as acute coronary syndrome as well as active arrhythmias. When it comes to actually repleting potassium, there are more or less two common options, oral potassium chloride and IV potassium chloride. Oral KCL is indicated for the majority of patients. The maximum dose is 40 mL equivalents at a time given every four hours or occasionally as fast as every two hours in unusual circumstances and when closely monitored. The major side effect of oral potassium is GI upset, so it should be given with food if at all possible. IV potassium is indicated for patients who are NPO. The maximum repletion rate is 10 mL equivalents per hour if given via a peripheral vein, or 20 mL equivalents per hour if given via a central line. It's extremely common for IV potassium to cause burning pain along the vein proximal to the IV site. Although this was previously treated with um, lidocaine being mixed in with the potassium, this is no longer recommended. Due to the possibility of abrupt shifts in serum concentration when IV potassium is used, all patients receiving IV potassium should be on continuous cardiac monitoring. There is no hard rule that allows one to predict how much potassium is needed to replete a patient back to normal, as it obviously depends on whether the potassium loss is ongoing. However, assuming that the loss is not ongoing, and that the hypokalemia is not the result of internal redistribution, in my experience with adult patients, I've found that for every 10 mL equivalents of potassium, 
there tends to be an increase in the serum potassium by about 0.1 mole equivalents per liter. For example, to take an, a serum potassium of 2.5 and restore it to the normal range above 3.5, we'll take about 100 mole equivalents. Of course, those 100 mole equivalents of KCL should be given gradually at an average rate no faster than that listed ab above here. In patients whose hypokalemia is due to internal redistribution, particularly hypokalemic periodic paralysis, be especially careful with potassium repletion since it is very easy for the patient's potassium to quickly swing the other direction into severe hyperkalemia. For patients whose hypokalemia is due to a diuretic that really shouldn't be stopped due to other conditions, such as symptomatic heart failure, or um, when the hypokalemia is due to hyperaldosteronism, adding a potassium-sparing diuretic is usually more effective than chronic potassium repletion. That concludes this video on hypokalemia. The next and final video in this series on sodium and potassium disorders will cover hyperkalemia.